So then what are the detailed features of this production function? So the first property of the cup Douglas production function we want to look at is that we argue it has the property of the constant return to scale. When we say an equation preserves the property of the constant return to scale is that if we increase the input and then we are going to increase the output proportionally. So now let's assume we have new capital input, which is x times of the earlier capital input. We have the L term that represents the new labor input, which is x times of the earlier labor input. And then we are going to put them into the original production function. We say that the new output will equal to A given the same technology, multiplied by K plus to the power of theta, multiplied by the L plan to the power of 1 minus theta. So then the K plan and L plan here are the new capital and new labor. So then what we are going to have next is that we can uh, plug in the XK into the X plan and plug in the XL into the L plan. And then we are going to have equation like this. We can rearrange the equation and then we are going to take out all the x and then there will be x. So now we are going to have a multiplied by x multiplied by k theta and the l power to the 1 minus theta. So then when you compare this new equation with the original equation we write up in here, we will see that we have the a k theta l to the power of y minus theta that are exactly the same. So we can plug y into this equation and then we are going to have x y. So this equation now tells us the new output equals x times the old output. For example, x equal 2, it means that when we double the input, we are going to double the output. That is exactly the property for constant return to scale. Now we want to move on to talk about the second property of the cop douglas production function. That is the property of the constant share of income from capital and labor. So what does it mean that it has a constant income share? And what is the income share? So when we produce goods, we are going to sell goods. And then when we sell goods, we are going to receive income from selling the goods. So for example, if we produce 10 oranges, we will sell them and receive income from selling the oranges, for example, $100. Once we receive the payment, we need to pay back to all the contributor to this production process. We may hire workers to work for us. We may rent capital to harvest the oranges. So then we need to pay them back for their contribution to the production process. So the total payment I made to the labor owner relative to the total income I receive by selling the goods will be called the labor share. The total payment I made to the capital owner relative to the total income I receive will be called the capital share. So in here we argue that if our production process can be described by the cop douglas production function, then there will be a constant labor share and constant capital share. So why that is the case? So let me show you a proof for that. So to begin with, I want you to think about what you learned in microeconomics. In micro class, we say that for a rational firm, when they want to choose the amount of the capital and labor they want to put into the production process, they always maximize the profit or the production and then choose the amount of the capital such that the return to capital, which is the payment to the capital owner, equal the marginal product of the capital. The same thing for labor, that they will choose the amount of labor such that the marginal product of labor will equal to the wage payment for each unit of the labor contribution. So if you don't understand why that is the case, that is okay because later on we are going to go through the detail again. But for the time being, I just assume you learn it and you remember it. And then we want to proceed to prove the property of the Cobb-Douglas production function. 
So then based on this Cope Douglas production function, now we want to come up with what should be the marginal product of the capital. We say the marginal product of capital equal to dy over dk, which tell us how much output will increase given an increase in the capital input. Then given that the Cobb Douglas production function tells us the y equals ak power to the theta multiplied by l to the power of one minus theta, when we take the first order derivative on y with respect to k, then we are going to have theta multiplied by a multiplied by k theta minus one multiplied by l to the power of one minus theta. Then let's rewrite the equation. We are going to get theta a k theta divided by k multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta. So then uh, what we are going to get is that the a k theta multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta that will be equal y. And then so what we are going to get in here is that we are going to get the marginal product of the capital equal theta multiplied by y over k. So then what will be the total return for capital? We know that the firm will choose the k such that the marginal product of the capital equal r. Therefore, when we want to compute the total return for capital, which is the payment for capital owners, we know the amount the firms pay will be r multiplied by k. Given that the r equals mpk, so we replace the r with mpk and then the total return for capital will then becomes the MPK multiplied by K. And then we plug in what we already have above that the MPK equals theta multiplied by Y over K. We are going to get the total payment to capital owner will be theta multiplied by Y. So then what should be the total income received by capital owner relative to the total income the firm receive? Well, that will be the definition for capital share. That will be the total return for capital divided by the total income the firm received, which is the total value of the output. So it will be R multiplied by K divided by Y, given that the R multiplied by K equals theta multiplied by Y, and the denominator is also Y. So what we are going to get is theta. So then based on the Cobb Douglas production function, we know that the capital share need to be equal theta. And that is exactly the theta we put as the power term for K in the production function. Now we want to do the same thing for labor. We say that the marginal product of labor under the Cobb Douglas production function will be dy over dl. Given that the y is equal a multiplied by k power to theta multiplied by l power to 1 minus theta. So when we have dy over dl, we are going to have 1 minus theta multiplied by a multiplied by k to the power of theta multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta. And then we can rewrite the equation and then we are going to get 1 minus theta multiplied by a multiplied by k theta multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta divided by l. So again, we know that the a multiplied by k theta multiplied by l 1 minus theta equals y. So then we can rewrite the equation. We said that the marginal product of the labor under the Cobb Douglas production function equals one minus theta multiplied by y over L. And then we do the same thing. We want to come up with the total payment to labor owner. We know that the firm will choose the labor they want to hire uh, at the point where the marginal product of labor equal the wages. So then we will be able to replace the wages with the marginal product of the labor and multiply by the quantity of labor that is employed in the production process. So that will be the total payment for labor owner. And then so we can plug in the marginal product of labor we obtained above, and then we are going to get y minus theta multiplied by y over L and then multiply by L and then we are going to get 1 minus theta multiplied by Y. So then what will be the total income received by labor owner relative to total income? For this whole term, it means the labor share. 
So again, we are going to get the total payment for labor, which is one minus theta multiplied by y. And we have the total income, which is the y, because that is the value of the goods that the firm sell for. So then we have one minus theta multiplied by y divided by y. And then we are going to get one minus theta. And that is the labor share under the assumption that the production function is capital goods. So now we know if the production process is characterized by Cobb-Douglas production function, then one minus theta will go to the labor owner and the theta will go to the capital owner. So then what will be the part that is left? Well, there's nothing left. So there will be an additional property based on the constant return to scale for the Cobb-Douglas production function which is that we have the total income, we split out, and then we pay to capital, and we pay to labor, and then nothing got left. So then we claim that based on the cop douglas production function, we are going to have zero profits. So now we want to show that the cop douglas production function has a third property, which has a positive marginal product of capital and labor, and a diminishing marginal return for capital and labor. This property is very common for the production function that we assume for all different types. And we want to show that why Cobb-Douglas production function also preserve these properties. So then let me draw the graph for a production function. And when we say it has a positive marginal product of capital and labor, and here I just show an example for capital, we say that the slope on the production function will be a positive line. As long as the line has a positive slope, then it implies that the marginal product of the capital is positive. Because when the slope is positive, then it means that the additional input will bring in an increase in the output. So it means that the marginal product of the factor of production is positive. So then when we say the production function exists the property of the diminution marginal return for capital and labor, it means that the marginal return will decrease as the K increase. So in graph, we show that at two points, that is the point K, the slope is in black. And then the, for point K2, the slope is represented by the red line. As you can see in here, that when we increase the k, the slope becomes flatter. When the slope becomes flatter, it means that the increment of the marginal product of return will be less at the point of k2 than k1. So then it implies a diminution marginal return for capital. So now what we want to do next is that we want to show the Cobb-Douglas production function in equation has these two properties. So what we want to do is that we want to look at the marginal product of capital based on the Cobb-Douglas production function. We will also look at the changes of the marginal product of the capital when K increase. So then we will see what is the implication for the changes of the marginal return for capital under Cobb-Douglas production function. So for the marginal product of capital, we can have it as dy over dk because the marginal product of the capital tell us how much does the production increase when we increase the k. In the equation, we are going to get theta multiplied by a multiplied by k to the power of theta minus 1 multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta. And you can get it from the above discussion. And then so from here, we know that it equals theta multiplied by y over k, given that the theta is the number between 0 and 1. So we know this number is positive. So then we know it is slope upward at point k1 and k2. So then how about the changes of the MPK? The changes of the MPK will be the derivative of the MPK relative to K. So then it will equal theta minus one multiplied by theta multiplied by A 
k to the power of theta minus 2 multiplied by l to the power of 1 minus theta. And then what we are going to get is theta minus 1 multiplied by theta and multiplied by y over k. Given that again theta is a number between 0 and 1, so we know theta minus 1 is negative, theta is positive, y and k are both positive, so then the dmpk over k will be a negative number. So then what it tells us is that when we move from k1 to k2, the slope is becoming smaller in number, and in graph, it will be implying a flatter line. So now we want to do the same exercise for labor. We have the same plot that is a production function, but now the factor of input is labor. So then we want to look at when we move from L1 to L2, how does the marginal product of labor got changed? So then, first of all, we need to look at the marginal product of labor. We are going to get 1 minus theta multiplied by y over L, and we know it is a positive number because theta is a number between 0 and 1. Y and L are both positive, so we know that the marginal product of labor under Cobb Douglas production function is positive. So it is a positive slope line at point L1 and L2. And then when we look at the changes of the marginal product of labor when we increase the L, we are going to get 1 minus theta multiplied by minus theta multiplied by y over L. Again, given that theta is a number between 0 and 1, we know that 1 minus theta is positive, minus theta is negative, and y over L are positive. So then we know this term is negative. So then it implies that when we move from L1 to L2, the slope will become flatter. And that is about the diminution marginal return for labor. So up to this point, we complete the discussion related to the three properties of the Cobb Douglas production function. So to end the discussion related to the Cobb Douglas production function, I want to tell a story that why it is called Cobb Douglas production function. So Cobb is an economist and also a mathematician, and Douglas is an economist and also a politician. Uh, it's what Wiki say, and I haven't verified that. So what we know is that Cobb meets Douglas, and it's very likely that Douglas observed what's going on in the economy, and then he go to Cobb and he say, hey, I want to have a production function that preserves the property I observe for the production process, that is constant return to scale, constant share of income from capital and labor, and positive marginal product of the factor of production, and a diminishing marginal product of the factor of production. So then he goes to Cobb and say, hey, Cobb, please come up with an equation for me. So then the Cobb think about the equation that can incorporate all these properties in one equation. And that is why the cobb douglas production function is a very important production function. We use it quite a lot in our economic research because it preserves the property that describes most of the production process. This is the end of the story and the discussion related to Cobb-Douglas production function.